Let me read to you a passage from the sixth chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, verses 14 to 29. It's the Gospel for Friday of the fourth week in ordinary time. St. Mark writes, King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, He is Elijah, and still others claimed, He is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against, her, against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportunity, the opportunity came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you, up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. That's from Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. What does it suggest to us? Well, of course, it tells us of sin. You know, in one of his sermons preached in September 1849, a few years after becoming a Catholic, John Henry Newman refers to the argument for the existence of God from the external world. He regards this argument as somewhat, and I quote, dangerous at this day because it tells us nothing about sin. The world, he says, after all, was made before sin. In an earlier Anglican sermon, he observes that the laws of the universe, and I quote, do not speak to sinners at all. They declare the glory of God, but not his will. We see nothing there of God's wrath of which the conscience of the sinner loudly speaks. The world has come from the hand of God, but sin is found within it, and this has come from man, prompted by the demons. It is an intriguing fact that society, culture and education of the past few centuries has been filled with a scientific knowledge of the universe that was scarcely imagined in the eras before. But the most fundamental feature of the world is denied or ignored. I'm referring to sin. Immorality and the violation of the civil law is fully admitted and attracts severe sanctions. But sin, wrongdoing of any kind precisely as offensive to God, is absent from the account. The sense of sin must be recovered. Now with that thought in mind, the thought of sin, let us turn to our Gospel passage that I read earlier, in which there is a dramatic juxtaposi juxtaposition of the holy with the sinful. The context is the fame of our Lord in Galilee. His reputation was reaching Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee, and his court. Antipas was the youngest son of Herod the Great, and of course had been raised in a family that had little if any religion, despite his famous father's building of the spectacular Temple of Jerusalem. 
Antipas had been educated in Rome and had perhaps picked up the typical Roman re religiosity with its propensity for a certain superstition. We remember, for instance, how when Pontius Pilate was told that his bafflingly calm prisoner, Jesus, claimed to be the Son of God, well, he feared greatly. And he went to ask Jesus from where he came. To this he received no answer. But the incident suggests that Pilate was a man of religious superstitions. Now Antipas had little concern for sin, but appears as superstitious. Herod Antipas hears of Jesus of Nazareth, of his teaching, his healings, his exorcisms, and his fame as a prophet. He jumps to the, well, ridiculous conclusion that this Jesus is in fact John the Baptist risen from the dead, and back from the dead had supernatural powers. Others thought this too. Others tell him that he is the promised Elijah, now returned as foretold. Others say he is a prophet, or one of the prophets, but Herod, perhaps secretly frightened, insists it is John whom he had beheaded. His fears are perhaps tightening within him, and Mark explains the circumstances of the beheading of John. Having condemned Antipas for marrying his brother's wife Herodias, John had been arrested and imprisoned. While Antipas superstitiously feared John for his great sanctity, Herodias nursed an implacable hatred of him. The entire situation was steeped in sin and John was in chains. There was an impasse because Herod would not touch his catch. He was drawn to listening to John, whom he must have visited or brought into his presence. Herodias could do nothing, but the chance came on Herod's birthday, when a great celebration was thrown involving a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. We can imagine the lack of religion in such a scene. The important people of Galilee, who were on good terms with Herod Antipas, were gathered to enjoy a great party. The daughter of Herodias entered to, ent to entertain Antipas and his worldly concourse in the hall. God was absent and Satan was present and very active. His instrument of action was the love of sin that enveloped the merry hall. The girl danced and delighted all present and Antipas swelled with the prospect of appearing the big man. Human respect overwhelmed him and he was determined to impress everybody. I will give you anything you ask, he said loudly to the girl, with liquor perhaps rolling down his chin. Ah, out skipped the girl, and back she sauntered with her awful request. Give me the head of John the Baptist, and on a dish, so that I can take it with me. The die was cast, and in a terrible moment, Satan won. Ultimately, there are two poles in the world, and they are opposite apart. There is good, and there is evil. There is holiness, and there is sin. There is God and Christ. And there is Satan and the unseen smoke of his presence. Satan, as our Lord said on one occasion, is a liar and a murderer, and has been that from the beginning. We see the results of Satan and sin in the Gospel I read earlier. Why do we have any part with it? It is ugly and terrible beyond description. Let us renounce sin and Satan, and take our stand with God and Christ, as did John whatever be the cost, that the victory will come is as sure as day follows night.